guys, welcome back to Jess and Reed's Romance. Today I'm going to be starting a reading vlog. It's been a while since I've done like a themed reading vlog, um, weekend reading vlog, and I'm pretty excited about this one because it's something that I meant to do last year and I never got to. Um, so all of the books that I have on this TBR I had picked out basically last year. And I decided that I wanted to read some books set in Louisiana. If you don't know already, I'm from Louisiana. I live in Lafayette, which is in South Central Louisiana. I am in Cajun country. And one of the things, this is why the purpose of this vlog is because sometimes when I read books set in Louisiana, most of the books set in Louisiana that I've read, romance books, have been set in New Orleans. Sometimes I feel like authors only know how to write a cliche of Louisiana characters and they get some things wrong. And I feel like this is just kind of like a common thing. If you read a book that is set in your hometown, in your state, in your area, whatever, I feel like you're gonna have some nitpicky things. And of course, I mean, not everyone has like the same life experience. So some other people that live in my area might disagree and maybe think that the stuff that bothers me doesn't really bother them. But anyway, I just thought it would be interesting to attempt to try more books set in Louisiana and see if I can find some books that I'm just like, damn, that was really well written. And I feel like it was a good representation of a character who is from Louisiana. Because I swear if I read one more book with a Cajun from New Orleans, <laughs> I'm going to blow. Little history lesson, you may not be interested in this, but I feel like it's important. Um, this is the Acadiana region. The dark red portion is like the heart of Acadiana where like Cajuns have settled. This is where I am in the middle of Cajun country. And this is where New Orleans is. It's not in Cajun country. You wanna know why? Because people who live in New Orleans, not all of them, but if your family goes back generations and generations and have, have lived in New Orleans, you're most likely of Creole origin, not Cajun. They're completely two different cultures and romance writers get them mixed up a lot. There's many differences between Creole and Cajun, mainly where they're from. Cajuns originated from like Nova Scotia, Canada. Well, they cross from France first into Nova Scotia, were kicked out of Nova Scotia, and then came into South Central Louisiana. And Creoles are descendants of the French and Spanish and African settlers in New Orleans, in the New Orleans area. It's like the melting pot. So lots of freed slaves um, actually married French or Spanish settlers, and that's where we get Creoles from. Okay, history lesson over. Now, let's talk about the books that I've selected for this vlog. The first book that I have is Shadows by Kristen Proby. Proby? Pro boy? <laughs> Sounds like po' boy. No, I'm gonna be Proby. Okay, anyway, I don't know how you say her last name, but I'm gonna say Proby. Kristen Proby, I have read one book by her before, and it was set in New Orleans or the outskirts of New Orleans. Um, I don't remember what I thought about it. I'm pretty sure I had some nitpicky things to say, but this is her first book in her Bayou Magic series, and I also got it for free like a year ago. I thought that it would be interesting to read a more paranormal book because the heroine who heads up um, ghost walking tours in New Orleans, she can actually see ghosts. And so there's like this mis mystery going around of like some missing girls. And then apparently there's this really interesting, hot, I'm sure he's hot, guy who ends up on one of her tours. And the synopsis is very vague from there, but I'm very interested about it. I also really like the cover for this book. So that's why it's on here. I honestly have no idea if Kristen Proby is from Louisiana or has ever been to Louisiana. I think I looked at her about me section and I don't think it said really anything, but I know that she doesn't currently live in Louisiana. Next book I wanted to read is Sweet Home Louisiana. I've read quite a few. I've read definitely more than three and they've all been okay. Lots of what I would call cliches, but I want to try out this second Boys of the Bayou book because it's an opposites attract romance and I really like opposites attract romance. It's also a uh, second chance romance as well because the heroine I believe grew up in the New Orleans area and then she didn't want anything to do with the country lifestyle as she put it and she moved to Cali and so she's been there for like 12 years or so but she has to return back because she owns a portion 
of the family business and in order to sell it, I think that there's some sort of agreement that she has to like stay there for 30 days. So she gets to meet her like high school sweetheart again. The next one is Say You'll Be Mine by Maria Louise. I've not read any books at all by Maria Louise, but I do know that she does in fact live in New Orleans. She's not from here, but she I think moved here for school, ended up by marrying someone local and now she stays here. So I think that it'll be interesting to read one of her books because in theory she should have a good grasp on like authentic Louisiana culture, authentic New Orleans culture. This is the first book in the Nola Hart series. This is another second chance romance <laughs> where the heroine returns after like moving away and she runs into her old high school sweetheart who is a homicide detective. And I do believe that Maria Louise's husband is also a detective as well. So yeah, I'm very interested to see what Maria Louise's take on New Orleans is. Then I wanted to pick up Tall, Dark, and Cajun. I picked this book specifically um, because there's Cajun in there. And so I'm like, okay, what do you have to say about Cajuns? Let's see, let's see. Um, Sandra Hill, I actually am more familiar with Sandra Hill's historical rom romances. I know that she has a very popular like Viking romance series, which I haven't read yet. I'm pretty sure I own a couple of them on my historical shelf that the majority of the books that are on there I have not read yet. Um, but I thought, it, I thought it would be fun to read Tall, Dark, and Cajun. So the heroine is, um, she's 30 years old, which is another reason why I want to pick up this book because there's not many books that I read with heroines 30 plus, but she has been in a seven year engagement with her fiance and she finally breaks it off with him. And after this breakup, she decides to travel south. I don't know where she currently resides, but um, to visit her great aunt Giselle. And according to the synopsis, like she was she was having like expectations of what, what to expect. And then she comes upon her aunt Giselle's house, which is on stilts basically. And I'll talk about that when I actually read the book, you'll get my thoughts. But the hero is a veteran and also a helicopter pilot. And apparently he wants some land that Aunt Giselle owns. So this could potentially be like an enemy to lovers romance. Anyway, I think that I have a good mix of books on there. Definitely more contemporaries than anything, but yeah, we'll see which one I like the best. I think I'm going to start with Shadows by Kristen Proby because I just read a bunch of contemporaries. So I feel like a change of pace is kind of needed. So yeah, I'll give you guys my thoughts once I get more into this book. It's time for an update. So I had insomnia last night and I finished Shadows by Kristen Profi. So here's my review of the book. Um, I like the premise of this book. It kind of felt a little bit like a Criminal Minds episode. Our heroine, Brielle Landry, which I find that funny because I know a Brielle Landry. Brielle heads up a ghost walking tour, sorry go silent um a ghost walking tour and she actually does see ghosts and what she sees are actually shadows she cannot make out like individual features but i think she can tell if it is a man or woman an adult or a child like she gets a general sense of them but she can't make out like features or anything but that changes one day while she's on the walking tour she does see this woman and she can make out her features and she's kind of this ghost is following her which that doesn't normally happen after the ghost walking tour she had spotted this guy in the crowd who um was of course very handsome his name is cash and he kind of talked to her and they did a little flirt but it didn't go further than that of course she runs into him again which i find funny <laughs> because it's new orleans and she ran into him like twice <laughs> within the space of like two days and it's just crazy that she would run into him but of course everyone knows if you're going to set your book in louisiana it's going to be new orleans and if it's going to be in new orleans it has to be in the french quarter because there's no other place in new orleans to go but i digress i digress so they do run into each other a couple of times and they're enamored with, e with each other <laughs> cash's brother which cash is originally from savannah his brother now works in New Orleans. He and his wife had moved there like two years ago. So he's there visiting. And his brother works for the um, New Orleans Police Department and Cash himself is an FBI profiler. He finally finds the balls to ask out Brielle on a date and literally on the first date, she unloads that she can actually see ghosts. I am so sorry that that noise is in the background, but the show must go on. I found it very funny that, and I wasn't mad that he accepted pretty much right away that she could see supernatural things. Like he, be, he didn't believe in the supernatural, but when she confessed to being able to see ghosts, 
he really rolled with it. He was just like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> he didn't blink an eye. And when he's walking her back, she gets really afraid because what happens, she sees another ghost. So we have the first original ghost and she's freaked out because she could see this girl's features and it looks like she's been tortured. Well, all of a sudden there's a second ghost joining her and she recognizes this person. This person was actually on the walking tour, the same walking tour that Cash was on. So she now she's freaked out. She's like, this girl named Tammy, she actually talked to me. Like, I know who this is. And this is, this is really freaky. So she calls her two sisters. Both of her sisters are also, they also have magical abilities. They're all considered witches. Brielle's power is to see ghosts. She's never been able to see the full forms of them before. The middle sister is a hedge witch, so she creates like potions and also like protection charms, stuff like that. And then the youngest sister is able to touch objects and kind of view memories and past events that are attached to that object, people that touch the objects and stuff like that. So they're all trying to figure out what is going on. There's somebody killing girls. There's a serial killer apparently. So they need to alert the police department and I didn't know this, but I picked up on it real quick. This is the first book of the Buying Magic series and it does have paranormal elements in it, but it is connected to her Boudreaux series, which is the contemporary one that I have read the first book in that series. And it was fine, but I didn't really love it. And I can't remember too many details because I read it a number of years ago. Overall, I think that this book was a good time. Like I was enjoying it. I especially, it was really cute because their relationship almost had an insta love -y quality, like faded mates, but they never actually said like faded mates, those words, but it felt like it. On their first date, they were like, why do I feel like I've been knowing you for years? They were feeling forever on the first date. So it is kind of insta love -y, but I thought it was adorable. Cash was extremely like protective of her. He was very concerned. She was afraid and he's like, I don't want you to be alone. And they were attached to the hip from that moment on throughout the rest of the novel. I wish that there was a little bit more about like the magic Magic and the witch community. We we do meet other people um, who are witches in New Orleans when the girls are kind of in over their head and they have to meet with older and wiser witches. I wish that powers, like witches' powers, were explained a little bit more. We get a hint that there is a journal that the grandmother had given them, but they haven't read it because their mother was neglectful and abusive and also killed their father. <laughs> Brielle, as the oldest, when she turned 18, she actually got custody of her two youngest sisters because it was such a bad situation. Her mom lives on the bayou and I believe she said it was like an hour away from New Orleans and I'm pretty sure that's probably in Terreborn Parish if I had to guess. She really didn't say where, but I'm just guessing that it's somewhere in Terreborn Parish and parishes are counties in Louisiana, we're weird. So this particular case of missing girls is very much tied to the sisters, Brielle in particular, and like their history, like how they grew up, where they grew up their mom, the house that's extremely haunted. Definitely at times it was creepy. I almost feel like Kristen Proby inserts these elements that are really horrific, but very casually. And sometimes it was very strange. For example, there was a girl who the serial killer attempts to take from Bourbon Street and she actually gets away. So this is like the only witness that they have. Um, who's alive. And when she's telling them her version of events, she casually just drops in. She's like, I didn't think he was gonna kill me. I just thought he was gonna rape me. I've been raped before, so la la la. And I'm just like, she just like casually threw that in there. I'm like, damn. Just like acted like it was absolutely nothing that she has experienced rape before. It was just weird. Like that was a weird thing. And then of course we actually get to see the torture that the serial killer is inflicting upon these girls and it is very brutal. It's very, it's very gross, like very horrific. On the one hand, the book felt like almost like light, like too light and too dark. It was just, I don't know. It was, it was a strange mix. It's a strange mix of tone. Also of note, <laughs> one thing that I didn't particularly appreciate, it's not that I'm going to dock the book for this particular thing, but I do feel like I do need to warn you guys. And I cannot remember anything that I really read from the Boudreaux series, so I don't know if this is just Kristen Proby's writing style, but I wasn't expecting a fade to black sex scene or multiple sex scenes. She was writing about like the lead up to sex. She was writing about foreplay that Brielle and Cash were 
participating in. He even got a couple like one-liners, like dirty talk in there. And then all of a sudden when the main event was about to happen, it's just kind of like next morning. And I was like, what? No, don't trick me like that. I don't particularly care for that. I'm not saying that there hasn't been books, especially like urban fantasy series that follow like the same couple or anything that I love, AKA Kate Daniels. There's barely any sex in that series at all. Alone Andrews just doesn't, she's not explicit about any of that stuff. But I don't care because I love the story that so much, but I did care for this book. So overall, I'm going to give Shadows 3.5 stars. Now, as a side note, I just want to discuss like how Louisiana, um, specifically New Orleans culture is portrayed in this book because this is kind of the whole purpose of doing this vlog is just seeing how do other people see um, New Orleans. Again, like I said, I have no idea if Kristen Proby is from Louisiana, has ever lived in Louisiana, or has only visited. I have no idea. I have not dug that deep. But I will say, like I said, this book is mostly set in the French Quarter, which is the most heavily featured tourist trap area. That's where all the tourists want to go. I'm not saying that locals don't live in the French Quarter area, but almost all the books that I read, the main characters live in the French Quarter area because everyone thinks it's cool to be like right next door to Cafe Du Mans and Bourbon Street. And I'm like, if you like really high priced rent, no grocery stores, hanging out with tourists all the time and bars like just everywhere, so very rowdy crowds, especially tourists. tourists fuck up New Orleans so bad. Everyone's like, oh my God, New Orleans is so crazy. I'm like, that's the tourists, they're crazy. Anyway, I would have loved to see different parts of New Orleans, that's just, that's just me. But again, like I said, if you're not from New Orleans, it's easiest, it's easiest to feature the most iconic like landmarks, the most iconic restaurants that most tourists want to visit when they go there. So that was all in here for sure. And the scenes that we get on the bayou, random bayou somewhere, we have a bunch of them. And of course, those houses that that we see, like her, the house that the girls grew up in, those are decrepit, falling apart, should be condemned. Just like really gross sounding. So it's either you live in New Orleans with that sophisticated city lifestyle, or you live in the boonies and you live in a house that should be condemned. And I'm like, cliche. But that doesn't go into my rating. It really doesn't because it just wasn't, it wasn't that big of a deal in this book, I will say. So the next book that I'm going to read is Sweet Home Louisiana. It's the second book in Erin Nichols' Boys of the Bayou series, I believe. And I was surprised to see that I actually read the first book, <laughs> which is My Best Friend's Mardi Gras Wedding or something like that. I don't know. Um, so in this scenario, I've only started reading like the first couple of chapters. The heroine, Morgan Allen, has moved to California 12 years ago and she's forced to come back because her brother has recently died, Tommy, and he was a partner in the Boys of the Bayou Swamp Tour company. She wants to sell her portion of the company and the other partners, including her ex, Owen Landry, and I find it funny that we have another Landry, second book that I'm reading, last name's Landry. I think it's the most easy pronounceable surname so I feel like that's often featured in romances for romances that are set in Louisiana but Owen Owen Landry from what I can tell their relationship like they were crazy about each other so much so that I think that their emotions were like seem to be really volatile and they can't be that old I haven't gotten their ages yet but I'm assuming that the last time that they saw each other they might have been in their late teens early 20s because I think that the reason why Morgan left was after a fight between her brother the one who died Tommy and Owen because I think that Morgan and Owen wanted to elope and Tommy didn't like that and so Owen like threw him through like a window or something I don't know crazy sauce so all I've got so far is that she's returned she needs to be convinced not to sell the, the portion of the company because they don't want some rando coming in. They would rather her be like a silent partner, but I think that she just wants to divorce herself from anything to do with Louisiana. Owen notes that she has lost her drawl, which I always find funny because there's so many accents in Louisiana. And if we're in the New Orleans area, they definitely have a specific accent. I don't know why I would categorize it as a drawl. Sorry, my battery died, but what was I saying? Um, Louisiana has a lot of accents. There's many in just Southern Louisiana. So I just don't think that I would categorize a New Orleans accent as a drawl, but authors who write about people living in Louisiana 
most always say that the accent is just a Southern drawl because all Southerners talk the same. I'm gonna jump back into this book and see what it's all about. I don't think it's very long, so it shouldn't take me all day to read this. So I will come back with an update. I promise I will update you on this book. Good morning, guys. I have an update for you about Sweet Home Louisiana. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to DNF this book. <laughs> I really did try to convince myself to finish it for the vlog. I'm like, Justin, you're doing a vlog. You said that you were going to read all these books about Louisiana. And then I thought about it and I was like, but why would I force myself to finish a book that I know that I'm not enjoying? This is my weekend. I wanna have fun on my weekend. No, we're not gonna push through a book that I'm not enjoying. So anyway, let me just take a little sip of my coffee. It still doesn't taste like coffee, but it's fine. I'm gonna keep making myself drink coffee until I learn to like this new taste or the old coffee taste comes back. My brain gets with the program. Now I do want to make clear that the reason why I'm DNFing this book is not solely because the author threw every cliche known to man about Louisiana into this book, but the story is just not compelling, guys. It's just not, it's just not it. I do not like these characters. Like I said, the heroine Maddie, she is from this area. This is a made up town close to New Orleans, but you can kind of tell by the locations that the, some landmarks are actually real. The town is outside of New Orleans and it is a small town where everybody pretty much knows everybody. And the reason why Maddie left, well, I got kind of more information on what was going on and it's really not i thought it was mostly because of the fight that owen had with her brother tommy who died a year past also his death is kind of crazy um i guess i'll throw up a spoiler um right here but the way that her brother tommy died was he was out in i'm guessing a fishing boat like the way that they were explaining it it really wasn't clear out in a fishing boat but i guess he somehow got in the water I'm not sure, and he got attacked by a bull shark. Now, bull sharks absolutely can come in fresh water, and definitely I would be worried about bull sharks or alligators, um, so I don't swim in the bayou. <laughs> but somehow her brother was alone and got attacked by a bull shark, but was also able to call his best friend Sawyer, who's a partner in their Boys of the Bayou company. And unfortunately, Sawyer got there too late and Tommy died in the ambulance. Sawyer also kind of got attacked by the bull shark too because like the fin apparently swiped his face and now he has a scar. I don't know, it was just a crazy scene that they were describing. I was just like, how is this happening? First of all, if he's in the water, how did he call Sawyer? Because Sawyer wasn't there. But anyway, I'm getting, I'm getting sidetracked. It wasn't, it wasn't because of the fight that her brother had with Owen, her little high school sweetheart. They got together when they were 16. It's because of her parents. So apparently her mom, her mom's family is from California, which is why she went to San Francisco. And her mom loved the energy of Louisiana and that's why she stayed there. And she bonded with the Landry family, which is Owen's family. So their, fam their two families were really close. Again, this is a spoiler for how her mom died. She doesn't reveal it until later, but apparently her mom was at a bar and decided to like dare this other guy named Bobby, who is not her husband, to take shots with her. And then they drove home, Bobby's in the car. They both were having shots of like whiskey, I don't know. And he crashed, her mom died. And then her dad got super pissed, first of all, because he lost the love of his life. Second of all, because he was wondering, well, what were you doing at a bar with a random dude getting drunk? Why would you get in the car with this random dude while he's drunk and you're drunk um, to bring you home? And also he's really mad at the drunk driver who killed his wife. So he decides to drive his truck into Bobby's house, like drive it straight through the wall and then try to beat him with a crowbar. So in her mind, in Maddie's mind, she's like, this is in my DNA. And the way that Owen and I were as teenagers, we were, we were so crazy about each other. We were so jealous. Like one time I went to my ex's house and I burned the stuff that he gave me on his front lawn because he was being mean to Owen about something and then it caught his shed on fire. And that's the type of stuff that happens when I'm in a relationship with Owen and when I'm in this town, it's not even just Owen, it's like when I'm in this town, this town makes me crazy. And I'm like, okay, that does sound crazy, but that sounds like a you bro. <laughs> I don't know if it's a town. I don't know if we can blame it on anybody else, but the whole premise is that they make each other insanely possessive and they're expressing their desire for each other in very like unhealthy ways. So even though 12 years have passed, she's very 
afraid that now that she's back and she's required to stay there for a month because of a contract that their grandparents drew up when they started the business, if one partner wanted to get out, they had to give it 30 days so that they could see if they could work it out. Kind of like therapy, like, hey, we're gonna go to therapy first, see if we could fix this, and then we'll see. So for the first 20% of the book, it's the same day that she arrives in town and people are so happy to have her home and she's telling herself like, I can't get pulled in, I can't get nostalgic about this town, um, I have to remind myself of why this isn't, this isn't good for me, why I don't wanna be in this town, and how she really wants to sell her part of the company, her stake in the company to this other guy who's from Savannah and who's kind of fascinated by Louisiana and these airboat tours. It was dragging so much, like 20% the same day, talking about all these little quirky things about the town and how so much more sophisticated San Francisco was to this little town because apparently this little town doesn't know of air conditioning. Like this is Louisiana boo. Even the smallest towns, I guarantee you, have air conditioning in the buildings because it is basically impossible to survive in Louisiana without air conditioning. So I just find it very hard to believe that this thriving business lacks air conditioning in their main building. It's just weird. So now we're getting to like the Louisiana stuff that just bothered me. Like I said, there was just so much going on. Like, of course they're eating like every single Louisiana dish you've ever heard of. Like they're eating that, they're talking about that. They're also having a crawfish boil in June and not many people know crawfish has a season. It's not just available year round. Boiled crawfish, like fresh crawfish that you catch and then you have a crawfish boil, not available year round. There is a season where they are available and while it's not technically impossible to have a crawfish boil in June. It's very unlikely that the crawfish will be good still because we're getting into the really hot summer months and that's just not good time for crawfish boils. And she talks about, she's like, oh, well, Bennett or whatever the guy that who she wants to buy her steak, oh, he'll love it because he can have like boiled crawfish like every week. And I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> you can't. The last scene that I read was they finally, after eight days, she finally got so jealous of these girls because apparently it's a thing for bachelorette parties to go on uh, swamp tours that when they mention like, oh, the guys who give the tours are really hot and they're telling, they're, the scenario just was so dumb, honestly. The way that the girls, these random girls who were wanting to get on one of the tour boats were telling random strangers who were checking them in like, oh my God, I, I wanna ride his big boat. Does he have a big boat? And like, it's innuendo or whatever. And I'm just like, you wouldn't talk this way to a random stranger, it's so weird. So Maddie gets jealous and she tells them that Owen is a slob, he has rats in his house and he also has had typhoid fever. And I'm like, anyway. It's just so dumb. The dirty talk isn't it. Like the last scene that I read was them kind of like getting frisky in the office and it was just the chemistry's not there. I just don't like these characters at all. I don't like them at all. So I'm just gonna DNF it. Speaking of air conditioning, do you hear mine in the background? It's always running. And it's only me. So the next book that I'm going to be trying out is Say You'll Be Mine by Maria Louise. This is going to be another second chance romance. I'm kind of regretting that the books that I found, like I didn't look deeper for other romances that weren't second chance because I just didn't really love that whole scenario. And this one is a second chance romance. Shaylin Lawrence is back after 12 years. What's up with these 12 year gaps between? <laughs> this is just weird. She's returning to New Orleans to take care of her grandmother. And then she runs into her high school sweetheart, Brady, who apparently broke her heart and now he's a detective and a family member needs her help for something and there's only one person she can approach, which I'm assuming is Brady. And that's all I wanna read into it. So I'm gonna start that right now. Let's see how far I get this morning. And hopefully it's just a better fit than the last book because I really do wanna enjoy this vlog. And I am saving a uh, Tall, Dark, and Cajun for last because I don't know, my expectations are a little high. It sounds funny, so I hope it is. Okay, let me drink my coffee before it gets cold. Reading update for Say You'll Be Mine. I am actually enjoying it quite a bit. I'm halfway through and things are just starting to get going. It's a fairly simple plot. It mainly revolves around the second chance romance. Um, there is a slight side plot going on in the background, but it hasn't really been fleshed out a lot. Um, so before I get into that one, let's talk about the second chance romance. So our heroine, Shaylin, after graduating high school, she overhears her boyfriend, Brady, talking to his grandmother saying that he wants to break up with her um, 
before school starts and stuff and it should be fine because Tulane is a big school because they're both supposed to go to Tulane. Um, Tulane's a big school and they probably won't run into each other, whatever. And then apparently she just decided to get out of Dodge, leave New Orleans, and she went to like a couple different cities, ended up in New York for a while. And she really hadn't been home since then. She didn't really have a great relationship with her parents who passed away two years before we find out. Um, because they had very high expectations for her. They really wanted her to become a doctor and they were very disappointed that she just seems to be drifting through life. She doesn't really have a career path. She just kind of dabbled in this and that, but never really had like a straight and clear path laid out for herself. So they really didn't welcome her back home. But now her grandmother, her Mimi Elaine, says that her health is not so great, so she should come back home. It seems like the grandmother is definitely playing that up. I don't know if she has any real health issues at this point, but you can just tell she wants her granddaughter back home and her she didn't want to come back home, Shay. There's too many memories. Well, of course, the day she comes back home, her grandmother is feisty. I love the character, Mimi Elaine. She is pretty funny. So Mimi is friends with Brady, um, Shay's ex's grandparents. Um, they all are the same age. And in fact, Mimi used to date Brady's grandfather. And that's a whole nother ball game. We won't get into that, but um, it creates some pretty humorous things. The Taylors are having a barbecue and uh, Mimi said that she accepted an invitation on behalf of Shay. And also she has hired somebody to pose as her fake fiance <laughs> because she wants Brady to know that her granddaughter has moved on from him. This is just kind of like the crazy antics that Mimi uh, gets up to and it's kind of easier to like go with the flow. So, <laughs> Shay goes to this barbecue with the guy that Mimi hired and he's married but her grandmother is paying him five thousand dollars to pose as her fake fiance and stuff and Brady's a detective so he's noticing little things and he notices this guy has a ring on his finger did Shay propose to him like what's happening he like knows some things up he doesn't know quite what's going on and you can tell like there's still sparks between Brady and Shay there's just so much history between them and so much so much that has been left unsaid because it just seems like there's there's something that's not like it seemed like I want to know what exactly happened between them um, when they graduated high school because I don't feel like I have the full story even at 50 percent I still don't feel like I have the full story for what happened when they were younger Shay also has something in her past that she's kind of ashamed of like some a job that she had in New York. She's not super proud of that. This attraction is very unwelcome by both of them because she doesn't want to get pulled into Brady's games again. And Brady is like, I don't have time to take up with a woman. He wants to be promoted. His grandparents were also disappointed in his career path because he was supposed to become a lawyer. He actually dropped out of Tulane um, and became a beat cop instead. So now he's trying to work his way up the ladder. So this is really important to him, but also to prove to his grandparents like he is climbing the ladder. And of course, getting distracted by Shay is not in his plan. So he's trying to like talk himself down, like don't get involved with her. But of course we know, we know it's gonna happen. Now the side plot that I was talking about, um, Shay has a cousin, Anna, who's a couple years older than her. And when Anna was a senior in high school, she got pregnant or she was a freshman at Tulane, I guess. Um, and she got pregnant and the guy who got her pregnant wanted nothing to do with with the baby and so just kind of left her son julian is 13 now and he's kind of like questioning like where's my dad um i want to know about him i want to see if i can find him type of thing and that's what kind of brings shay and brady back together because she feels like oh well i can ask brady if he could search his name and see like where is his dad you know what's he been up to what kind of guy is he because she doesn't know anything about him so we have like that mystery kind of unfolding in the background it does not seem like his dad is an upstanding guy um from the little that brady has uncovered already so anyway they these two for the first half of this book have been playing a little hot and cold um which i can't say that i absolutely love it but it's fine i'm rolling with it because I definitely enjoyed this book a lot more than the, than the Sweet Home Louisiana one. Um, speaking of Louisiana, I do like the stuff that Maria Louise includes 
in this book as far as like New Orleans like culture and stuff. One of the first things, the opening chapter, which I, I loved and I laughed and I was like, oh man, this is gonna be good, isn't it? The first time that she sees Brady when she comes back to New Orleans, she's in a convenience store and she's just turned around, she's about to go check out and she sees Brady and he's wearing a lacy red dress. And the red dress run is something that's pretty iconic in New Orleans. It happens like in August. So I knew, I was like, oh, this is something that I don't normally see included in books set in New Orleans. So I was just like really excited to see all that. She also uses like small phrases that I'm familiar with that I know that it's weird that we say stuff like it. So when after dinner she's cleaning up and she's washing the dishes, um, and her grandmother is talking to her and she was like, oh yeah, you were saving the dishes. That's something that we say. We're saving the groceries, we're saving the dishes, we're putting them away. So like, it's just little things that I feel like Marie Louise is really good at including. And I don't feel like she's shoving, you know, Louisiana and New Orleans culture like down my throat. Like it feels like a regular kind of novel that just so happens to be set in New Orleans. And we have perfectly placed nods to all the good things that we love about New Orleans, like the food, the places, and the architecture. So I'm just very impressed and I'm, I'm really liking it. For my first Maria Louise, I think it's pretty good. And I'm kind of hoping that the cousin Anna has a book because I know that this is a series, the Nola Hart series, and I'm wondering if Anna's gonna have a book. And if so, and if this book is like a four star, or five star, then I'm probably gonna continue with the series. But I don't wanna jinx myself. I still have, you know, half the book left, but I might be able to finish that by tonight. But I'll let you guys know what I think about it in the end. Good morning. I have a reading update for Say You'll Be Mine. I did stay up quite late making sure that I finished that one <laughs> because I knew that I had to read one more book um, today. Today is the last day for my vlog, Sunday. So Tall, Dark, and Cajun is definitely my reader. But before we get to that one, Let's talk about Say You'll Be Mine. Now, I thought that this book was a pretty good romance. Like, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give the book overall four stars. And I am really interested in actually continuing with the series. So I went um, on Amazon and I got the next book from KU. Let's talk about the romance. I did enjoy the romance between um, Brady and Shay. I'm not the biggest fan of second chance romances just because I find that some of the reasons why these couples were separated, especially like a long separation like this was, this was a 12 year separation where she just was like something happened when she was 18 and she decided to up and move somewhere and never really came back. Now I did find out some more stuff about like why didn't she come back and what was the deal with her and her parents which was interesting and sad as well. So that did make sense but just like it was just like a conversation that needed to be had. The whole misunderstanding about what she heard and what was actually going on behind the scenes that could have been cleared up if she would have not just run away like that first day. It was very reactionary but anyway I did enjoy them together. It was a pretty great romance. Now, the representation for NOLA culture and Louisiana culture was really great. And I kind of had, I don't want to say like high expectations for Maria Louise, but I know that she lives there. So it's like, if anyone's going to get it right, it's going to be her. <laughs> but she has like these small details that I was just like, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. It wasn't too oversaturated with Louisiana culture or New, or New Orleans culture. It was like a perfect balance and it like worked in with the story very organically. Like it just felt so organic, the stuff that she was mentioning. Like Brady and Shay had, were eating crawfish and okay, so it's August. The, the setting of this book is August because of the red dress run that I mentioned earlier. And that's pretty out of season, but she mentions that the crawfish were out of season, that these were out of season crawfish that they were having. And I was like, ah, thank you. Crawfish does have a season. So very well done. I was like, okay, all right. Now I will say they did have sex after eating crawfish and they just like gave, I think it was only Brady really that washed his hands. That was one bone that I had to pick with Maria Louise. I'm like, if I just ate crawfish and if my partner just ate crawfish, like you, you're going to soak your hands because your crawfish hands under your fingernails, that's not coming near my lady bits after you eat crawfish. That is spicy. Okay. I remember when I used to wear contacts all the time, like I would not take out my contacts the night after I ate crawfish because it would burn so bad. Like no matter how much I wash my hands, like I could wash my hands for 10 minutes straight, keep dous dousing them with soap and lemon juice and salt 
and my eyes would still burn if I tried to take them out because of the spices that are on your hands. So no, no sexy times after crawfish. I did, I was like, nope, mm-mm, <laughs> no. But anyway, there's a lot of other things like um, he mentions going to the camp in Grand Isle. That is very much a real thing. Grand Isle is um, a little coastal town on the Gulf of Mexico. Lots of people go down there. Um, they have camps and they go fishing. Mentioned vacationing in Destin. That is absolutely where pretty much everyone in Louisiana vacations for the summer. If you're going to the beach, everyone's going to either Gulf Shores or Destin, um, which is where I went last week. She mentions Zapp's potato chips. So they're kettle cooked potato chips chips that are a Louisiana brand and she mentions they were eating the voodoo flavor absolutely gold and I really liked how Maria Louise had them doing like just regular normal things going to places other than the French Quarter when he wanted to take Shay on a date Brady mentions some restaurants on Magazine Street and I was like yes please Magazine Street needs to be mentioned a lot more in these books that are set in New Orleans it has a vibrant atmosphere that lots of locals love and nobody ever talks about that when writing in New Orleans so I just found all of that just like very well done and and I'm very excited that I found a new author to read. So I will be continuing with this series and then checking out what other books Marie Louise has. Because I don't know if all of her books are set in Louisiana, but I did like her writing style and I'm excited to check her out. So Tall, Dark, and Cajun, Sandra Hill. Um, I talked about it at the beginning, saying that this is a romance about a, a, a woman who has an aunt who lives in Cajun country. And I've, I've discovered that I think it's Homa actually which is not where I live. It's closer to the New Orleans area, definitely, but right off the bat, like in the first couple of pages, the hero, Remy, is talking about, you know, where they're at. His sister is a hairdresser and she has um, a beauty salon in Homa and Lafayette, which is the town where I will, I live on the outskirts of Lafayette, but Lafayette. And then he's talking about his grandmother. So the very first scene, it's his birthday. And I think he's a scarred hero. I need more information. Um, I'm only on page two. But he's talking about his aunt who's like 79 and she wears spandex red mini skirts. She has like pink short curls and stuff like that. And she appears at his house to sing happy birthday to him. And she's ta and he's talking about how she is a noted traiteur. And I was like, okay, we're really getting into some Cajun culture type of stuff. So a traiteur, which I'll pop it up right here so you can see the actual word has healing abilities. So it sounds like it, it comes from some voodoo influence that was brought with slaves, but when they converted to Catholicism, they actually use still some of those remedies in Catholicism, like it was like, you can pray over a, a wart and you have to like bury a potato peel um, by the tree, but you also say like three Hail Marys and like one Our Father or whatever. So it's like a combination of Catholicism plus other like Afro religions and I love that she mentioned that. Um, my great, I'm not Catholic anymore, but my great grandmother was a traitor as well. And each traitor has like a specialty that they focus on, like, you know, the throat or the stomach or whatever. So anyway, I just thought that that was very interesting um, that right off the bat, she's like throwing up stuff that I'm like, absolutely, this is very, very small town, Cajun country, Louisiana. She also, he also calls her Taunt Lulu. So Taunt is the word for aunt. You can also call him Taunty. So I think I'm gonna have a a lot of fun with um, the dialogue in here. I, th I think we're gonna get some heavy Cajun influence. Um, so, and since they're in Homa, it's acceptable. It's not, I wouldn't say that the Cajun culture isn't like the same across the board. It just depends on what area. Like I, I showed that map of Cajun country um, earlier in the video. And it, depending on what area you're from, you're gonna have different Cajun traditions. Let's see what Tall, Dark, and Cajun is about. I expect some laughs from this book. Just by the synopsis, I think that this is gonna be more on the humorous side. So bring it. All right, a little change of scenery for this update. Um, and sorry, excuse the messy hair I've been doing cleaning up around the house and stuff. But I am, uh, I would say about halfway done with Tall, Dark, and Cajun. Um, and it's so interesting because when I started reading um, the book and I got the background for the heroine, I was like, this is different from what I read, the synopsis that I read. So I double checked and I would go look on Goodreads. According to Goodreads, this heroine has been with her, her fiance 
for a while and they've had a seven year long engagement, that is incorrect. They've only been together for five years and only been engaged for one year. So I know that that was, that's a distinction that really doesn't matter, but I just wanted to point out that the synopsis on Goodreads is a little bit different than what the book is actually about. Um, so Rachel Fauche, she's living in Washington DC and she was in the foster care system and about a year ago she found her birth mo mother who was living in Chattanooga, Tennessee and her mother was from Louisiana. So she finally got to contact her father's family. Her father died whenever he was 18. So she was alone in the world. And now that the engagement and the relationship with her plastic surgeon boyfriend is going down the toilet after one too many times of him blatantly telling her that she needs to lose weight and her butt's too big. Like you can tell that this book was written in 2003. There's lots of obsession with like women having like the perfect body and oh no, my butt's too big. My thighs are too big and I have cellulite type of thing. It's just the way that it's talked about. It's like, it's very 2000s, you know? So she decides to peace out after burning all of the gym equipment, which is so funny because I want to know where, where this gym equipment was kept. He must have had like a huge home gym because apparently they had a Stairmaster, two treadmills, a Bowflex, a butt buster, like all kinds of stuff. They had like so many things. And I'm like, that must've been like a huge ass gym space. But apparently she burns it in their apartment parking lot in DC. And I'm just like, sounds feasible. So her, her friends are encouraging her, like you need to get away since your grandmother from Louisiana has written you like go and visit her. So she gets a three month leave of absence from her work to visit her grandmother. She's never met her before. She just knows that her grandmother's named Giselle. And I want to say that the Goodreads synopsis also said it was her great aunt, but it's his great aunt. It's Remy's great aunt that is in the grandmother figure in his life. Anyway, I digress. When she gets to around the Homa area in Louisiana, which is a little bit um, southwest from New Orleans, and also the place where, um, what is that show that I have never actually watched? Swamp People? I believe Swamp People, they're from the Homa area, around that area. But she gets there and she's expecting like this like beautiful, southern plantation style home and like a cute little twin set wearing grandmother and what she gets is a house on the bayou that's on stilts and there's skinned animal pelts in the yard chickens pigs and just like it smells rank <laughs> and her grandmother has like long gray stringy hair she's wearing like hiking boots she's toting a shotgun all that jazz and this is her introduction. And she has just stumbled upon this like standoff between Remy Ladeau, his brother Luke, and the grandmother Giselle. And she also has a cousin Bo. Apparently Remy wants some land that Giselle has because he has um, kind of a deal with the DEA. There's some shady business going on. And if he gets this government contract, he needs to expand his land so that he can have a bigger place to land his helicopter. And I think he also does like buy you tours on his helicopter as well. But like he's looking for this government contract and he needs this land, Giselle's like, absolutely not get off my property. So she stumbles upon all this and the second that they meet eyes, there's like this thunderclap, this lightning strike. And all of a sudden it's just like, wow. And like the first thing that <laughs> I love, the first thing that Rachel asks Remy is, do you exercise? Do you have exercise equipment in your house? And he's like, no. And she's like, good. <laughs> because it's very love at first sight type of thing. Grandmother Giselle is not happy. She's like, you stay away from those Ladoes. They're no good. Their daddy um, has like nine children scattered around, legitimate, illegitimate, all that jazz. And he's trying to steal land from me. Um, but the heart wants what it wants. And since she is an interior decorator, she's very into feng shui. She gets roped in to doing um, Remy's sister, Charmaine. She has a salon in Homa and she wants to redecorate it. And then his great aunt, his taunty, asked for her to feng shui his houseboat for a belated birthday gift because she kind of she kind of sees sees what's going on there now this is like the over the top humor thing so there's lots of over the top situations that are happening but i am having a good time with it because it's so crazy there are a lot of cajun cliches in there absolutely but maybe it's because this is written in like the early 2000s that i'm giving it a little leeway there are some interesting things like remember um in the previous clip i talked about what a traitor does and actually rachel ends up by going with Aunt lulu on her rounds 
And she does actually cure a boy or she gives the boy the remedy for warts, which is rubbing a potato peel and going uh, plant it in the garden. So uh, that was one that I brought up. But like I said, there's lots of Cajun stereotypes. Like apparently Remy has not really a pet alligator, but they call him a pet alligator and his nickname's useless. And he feeds him like biscuits and stuff. And I'm like, that's the kind of stereotype that everybody thinks about Louisiana, that we have pet all alligators. And I'm like, I don't know a person that does have one, but you know, think what you're gonna think. So also of note, um, Remy's background was that he, I think he, he was a helicopter pilot and he had enlisted and his helicopter crashed. So he is severely burned on one side of his like entire body and his face is very noticeable. But Rachel, upon first meeting him, like just does not notice it at all. Thinks that he's still like incredibly beautiful which is very fortunate since they're basically soulmates. And he definitely has some insecurities about that. Um, and she she has her insecurities about her body that her fiance has instilled, her ex-fiance has instilled in her. So they're kind of like a match made in heaven. He's boosting her confidence about her body, saying like she's perfect, he loves everything about her, and she pretty much hates everything about herself. And she's boosting his confidence, gets very offended if anybody looks at him like sideways and calls him a freak or whatever, and she's like ready to throw down like right there. So anyway, they're really cute and they're really fighting it. There is that kind of mission that the DEA has for Remy saying that there there's some shady business going around in the bayou, which it's true. I mean, it's kind of the perfect place to do some shady dealings um, if you don't know where you're going. It's very hard to navigate <laughs> through those types of bayous. It looks like the wetlands and it's like the paths change sometimes depending on like the tide and stuff. So anyway, he's looking into that. Um, and when Rachel and Taunt Lulu were out gathering herbs and stuff, <laughs> in the swamp, they ran into some of these people who were doing shady, shady business and they almost got caught and luckily they escaped. So I think that that's gonna kind of come to bite them in the ass later. But yeah, so I am enjoying, I am enjoying this book. Right now it's sitting at around like a three, 3.5, like it's fine. It's not like the type of romance that I gravitate towards, but it's okay. And on my scale of like accurate Louisiana representation, it's not wrong. I just think it's very over the top. Like they're always having like gator gumbo, eating snake, squirrels, rabbits. I'm not saying that people don't eat that down here, but I'm just saying the amount of times that something kind of like really outlandish is mentioned. It's a lot, it's a lot. So it's a lot of Louisiana stereotypes in here. Anyway, um, I should be finishing this. Well, I hope I'm gonna finish it tonight. My mom did just call me. Oh, that's another interesting thing as well. So I find when I read books in Louisiana, if you're gonna have like a boil, like a seafood boil, it's always gonna be like crawfish. So people always wanna talk about Louisiana's eating crawfish and I talk about like crawfish having seasons and stuff and we're in late May right now. Crawfish season is tapering off like not many people are gravitating towards crawfish anymore but you will see a switch to crabs during the summer months and shrimp. So boiled crabs, boiled shrimp and that's what I'm eating tonight. Some boiled crabs and these are blue point crabs so not like a big snow crab or anything. It takes some work to eat crabs. Very sweet meat, love it to death. But if you do not know how to peel a blue point crab, it could be frustrating. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to have a couple more hours before I need to go to the grocery store and pick up some fixins, some sides um, for the crab boil. So I'll see how far I can get um, and I'll update you guys in a minute. All right guys, I finished Tall, Dark, and Cajun with time to spare before I have to go to my mom's and eat some boiled crabs, but I'm gonna give this book three stars. <laughs> um, I actually really liked the first 50% a lot better. It was very humorous, lots of insta lovey stuff, and it was mostly the conflict that happened toward the end. Well, wasn't even toward the end. Like the last fourth of the book was just like, conflict on top of conflict and most of it is kind of spoilery so I'll pop up a spoiler right here but like I said Remy has lots of um burn scars all along his body and he can't have children and one of the reasons why Rachel put her foot down is because her ex-fiance had a vasectomy without consulting her first they didn't talk about it he just did it in secret so that was like the final straw that made her want to take this three month break and go visit her long lost grandmother. So it's been two weeks since she's met Remy and they've been sleeping with each other and saying, I love you. 
So when he notices that she definitely has heart eyes while watching him play with his nieces and nephews, he kind of brings up with dread saying, you want kids, don't you? Um, he's infertile. And when he tells her, she she considers it a betrayal of trust because he didn't bring it up before. And I think it's just really important that it's only been two weeks since they've known each other. She, she brings, like he says, we've only known each other for two weeks. Like bringing it up now. And she was like, but we said, I love you. You should have brought it up sooner. I can see both sides, but I'm more on Remy's side on this. Like it's something that obviously it pains him to talk about. And I don't think you should be forced to talk about your infertility. Um, before you're ready and I definitely don't think like her reaction was so over the top to him not immediately coming out with hey I'm infertile it's obviously a sore spot for him and it's not even just that like that conflict that bothered me or that particular instance in which they talked about it because it was the main conflict between the two but later Remy says something to Rachel that I found too much like the author just went way too far with the conflict because she had been in the foster care system um she felt like she was unadoptable and when she brings up well you know maybe we can adopt kids later after they're like arguing he doesn't want to talk about it at all like he's drawn his line saying he's like I don't want to talk about it and she just keeps pushing 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 and when she brings up adoption he ends up by he's like I don't want to adopt some freaks that nobody wants or whatever so I was like but why Sandra Hill why why do we have to go this far like both of them were pushing so many buttons for me toward the end that it made it very unenjoyable the last half of it so this is definitely a three star I don't think it ever might never have made it in the four star range but yeah, the drama was just too much, too much for me. So if I'm ranking all the books that I read, by far, Say You'll Be Mine was definitely my favorite. It had the most enjoyable storyline. I really liked them as a couple and also really good Louisiana representation. Shadows wasn't bad. Kristen Proby's book was not bad at all. I just felt like the tone was a little bit weird. Then we have Tall, Dark, and Cajun. It's definitely a book of its time. You can really tell that it was written in a different like era of romance. Um, it wasn't too bad, but also just not, I probably wouldn't like super recommend it. And then of course, um, Sweet Home Louisiana by Erin Nicholas. Just lots of things bothered me about the book, but the one takeaway is that I did not like these characters and I did not root for them as a couple. Um, I didn't really love the whole scenario of why this second chance romance was a thing, like the reason why she decided to leave and what was holding her back from a relationship. Like I just didn't enjoy the conflict between Maddie and what was his name? Owen. Owen, I believe. I didn't enjoy that conflict. Yeah, I feel like this was not a bad vlog. This was not a bad vlog. I had a really good time. It was really fun. I think the main takeaway from this vlog is that expect lots more Louisiana cliches in books written by authors who don't live in Louisiana, which I think that that's a pretty obvious statement to make. But the only author who really included things that I was just like, yeah, that's like, you definitely have the inside scoop of somebody who's native to Louisiana and native to areas um, like New Orleans or other areas in the South that have Cajun influence. It's just so obvious that Maria Louise just knows what she's talking about. And I'm sure that other authors have done research and stuff, but there's just so much you can do with online research and word of mouth rather than actually experiencing it. So, all right guys, I hope that you enjoyed this reading vlog. I certainly enjoyed reading this weekend and getting back into the hang of actually vlogging. And I hope to do a couple more this summer. If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up. And if you're not already subscribed to my channel, make sure you subscribe to get notified of any future videos that I do. Thank you so much for watching and remember, life's better with a little HEA. Bye guys.